I just ate, so I'm a little sluggish after that m- Mexican food. Good Lord. So, how's everybody doing? You guys, uh, how many of you guys, how long have you been doing this? 39 years. What? 39 years. 39 years, wow. Anybody, any originals in here? Anybody that was here 39 years ago? No? One right here. One? Yeah, I've done it. Wow. Nice to meet you, man. 39 years. No. 43 years ago. He quietly corrects the entire realm. <laughs> 43 years ago. All right. Um, so what's the format now? I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about me, and then we'll just dive into the steps? Does that sound good? Uh, that's... that's <laughs> Let me just stop you right there. In control. Good God. All right. So anyway, Earl Alcoholic. I, uh, um, I started drinking when I was 12 years old. I stopped drinking when I was 28. Um, and things improved dramatically when I quit drinking. <laughs> um, I, I started drinking. I got, uh, I got shipped out. Of, I, got, I came, grew up in a violent home. And, and, you know, there's nothing special about my story. I grew up in a violent home. Um, I found that I was going to boarding school when I was 12 years old. My father uh, came in my room and told me to get in the car. So I got in the car, and they drove and drove and drove and drove and drove, and I got out of the car, and he got out of the car, and nobody else got out of the car. And he put a suitcase down next to me and said, this will make a man out of you, and got back in the car and drove off. And that was, I was in boarding school. Now, the fact is, I was being given an opportunity for a wonderful education, held me in good stead to this very day. But the feeling was is that I'd just been thrown away by the people who knew me best in the world, and I didn't know what I'd done to be, to be asked out like that. Um, and, you know, the fact was it was a great education. The feeling was is that, you know, I'd been thrown away. And I don't know about you, but I'm, I don't bother much with facts. You know, <laughs> like if I'm a feelings guy, if it feels bad, it is bad, right? And uh, so I thought this is horrible, and I spent about three days complaining and whining and crying and calling my mommy and, you know, get me out of here. And my father in the background saying, hang up! <laughs> you know, got to go, dear, and click. And uh, it was like something snapped in me, and I pretty much turned my back on my family and never went back. I thought, you don't want me, I don't want you, um, which was, wasn't true. But it was all I had, right? So I uh, got in a fight. And I, I mean, I got all, it just all went sideways within the first 72 hours. And the cool guy started coming around because he'd heard about this maniac little guy. I was the smallest and youngest kid of 250 boys in a boarding school. I was like Lord of the Flies in this joint, right? <laughs> And I got in a fight with the biggest guy in the school, and they, you know, word spread, watch out for this little high tower kid, he's a maniac, he attacked Diney, right? And, and uh, so a guy came, swung by and said, uh, yeah, you want to you wanna smoke a joint? And I said, yes, I do. <laughs> and I didn't even know what that meant, you know what I mean? All, but, but what I heard was, do you want to hook up with us? Do you want to come with us? And the answer was, yeah, man, I felt like I was alone in the world. So we, we, me and Matt picked up Steve, and Steve had a Tupperware container full of cheap red wine. I mean, no grapes involved red wine. You know what I mean? The fortified stuff. A little, a little Mad Dog. So he took some Mad Dog and some weed behind the dorm, two 13-year-olds and a 12-year-old, and we got loaded. And, I mean, it was just, just like that, man. Suddenly I was comfortable standing around, standing, doing what I was doing with the people I was doing it with. And I'd never felt like that before in my life. It was like I'd exhaled for the first time in my life. And I didn't know, is it the pot, is it the wine, is it the, my two very close personal friends, Matt and Steve? Because, you know, these are my boys now. I'm feeling this, right? I don't, I don't know and I don't care. You know, I feel better than I've ever felt in my life. Nothing bad happened. Nobody went to jail. No one went to prison. Nobody died. Nobody went to the nut house. I mean, all those things were going to happen, but they didn't happen that night. <laughs> that night, get high, feel fantastic, get up the next morning, got to find Matt and Steve. Just automatic. And it was that way. So, I, you know, every day for the next 16 years, no matter what, given a good reason, I did not stop. And a lot of bad stuff happened along the way. A lot of it was directly related to my drinking and using. The majority of it. All right? But some of it was just life on life's terms, man. I mean, when I was 20 years old, I got diagnosed with, and I dropped out of high school, hit the streets, doing what we do to stay loaded, got thrown in a nut house, 
you know, talked my way out of there, Wimp Street, got thrown back in the nut house, escaped from the nut house, you know, ended up in business college, you know, long story. <laughs> You know, studying marketing, production, distribution, applying it to my business. Business is booming. I think college is awesome. You know, it just my life is just mayhem. I'm just loose. I'm just on the loose, doing the best I can from day to day to just stay below the radar. That's all I'm trying to do is just, you know, take get a little ease and contentment and stay below the radar. Keep everybody off my back. Don't want anybody chasing me and just be cool. I don't want to be a big bad, you know, I don't want to be a, you know, the head of a drug cartel. I just want to just below the radar. I just, you know, I don't want to be on any lists. I ended up on some lists, but you know, you do what you can. Right. So I, I, it just, it was just, you know, back in the sixties. So it was, you know, pot and wine starting out, then it was barbiturates, then it was LSD. And I, you know, 600 trips later, I got classified legally insane by the military, you know, no. And then it was shooting dope. I'm drinking the whole way, always drinking. I'm one of those guys that from the very, I'm a child of the 60s, and we were very focused on being drug addicts, right? Because we were trying to carve out our own identity, you know what I mean? Our parents were the alcoholics, and we were, we were going to find a whole new way to kill ourselves. We were, we were focused on, that, on the drug. But the fact of the matter is that drugs are completely unreliable. There's no quality control going on out there. It's, you know, you don't know what you got till you get it in your body. But you go get a fifth of Jack Daniels, you go get a quart of good gin, you're going to be all right. That was my faith in life was I had faith in Jack Daniels. I had faith in gin that if, it, if, it, if I got a little over the line, I could dial it back with Jack, right? If it got a little too spooky, I could get back in the comfort zone with some gin. I could, if it, could, if it wasn't dark enough and quiet enough, you know, just heart and lungs working, I could get the rest of the way with booze. So no matter what else was on the table for me, it's booze. So from the day I came into this program to this day, I have always identified as an alcoholic because it's what made the difference for me. It was the only thing I relied on my entire run, even though I did enough drugs to, you know, fill 10 of the 100 of these rooms, right? And it's the thing that took me to my knees. It was the thing that ultimately caused me to surrender, to throw up my hands and yet say, help, I can't take it anymore. It was alcohol. Right. So blah, 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 high school, college, 20 years old, get diagnosed with malignant cancer. Right. Come to L back, go fly back to L.A., do major surgery in my upper back. They prepare me to die. I prepare my family for me to die. I don't die. I'm like a cockroach. Right. So, you know, you just bounce back, you just go back to living the way I'm living. You know, uh, and then my mother calls me and says, let's go somewhere. as a fa We have to go somewhere as a family. We got to put this family back together. Um, <laughs> You and your father got to stop it. Just, you have to stop it. I said, fine. Starting to sound like him at this point, right? Um, so I flew back to LA on my 22nd birthday, November 7th, 1974. We took off to fly to Guadalajara, and on the way there, the plane crashed. And my mother, my father, and my little sister all died in the crash, and I survived. And I came to in the wreckage, and my little sister was, uh, my mother was over there, my little sister Kimberly was right over there, and my father was laying right over there. And I had fractured my skull, broken my back in three places, crushed my arm and my leg, I was paralyzed from the waist down, um, had a lot of injuries, I was just busted up from head to toe. Only thing I could move was my right arm. And I couldn't get to any of them to help them, and I just laid there and I watched them all bleed to death in front of me. And it like flipped a switch in my head, and, and you know, it wasn't, you know, me shaking my fist or anything like that. It was just this, this quiet feeling inside. It was like this feeling went all the way through me where it was just, I'm out, man. I'm out. Any God that would take a kind, loving, gentle, poetic creature like my little sister and leave a lion cheating, thieving, dope fiend, alcoholic like me on the planet, I got no use for a God of this type, and I renounced God. And then some guys came up and they scavenged the plane wreck, and they took what they could find of value, and they left me there to die. And I... Uh, I had no more love for you either. So I had no love of man. I had no love of my, a God. Um, I was just, I was alone and angry. And I wanted the world to know my pain because that's all I had. All I had to bring to you was pain and I was going to bring it. So that's, that's, you know, the last thing my father ever taught me was pain will keep the shock back, you know, and you say you don't die, 
you know, at the rec set because he was he had but his one of his legs was just mangled and he kept picking it up and banging it on the ground and he would suck air and there was lungs, you know, and he did that for a few minutes before he died. So I just took the only thing I could move my right arm and I just kept banging it into my side and all my ribs were busted. So, you know, I'd bang it in my side and the pain was so intense. It would just pull me up out of the shock because it, it'll kill you. And I'd been hurt enough times to know that. that. And so I'm banging away on, on me, on myself and finally some of the other guys came up and they pull me down out of there and the federales interrogate me, interrogate me for three and a half days wanting to know what I'm doing back in Mexico because I had a little issue with the Mexican government that we don't need to get into here, but it was, you know, let's just say we'd, it was, they weren't happy to see me, right? So I finally called a guy in, in, in Northern California and he flew a plane in and they paid some guys off and they plastered me from the neck down, smuggled me out of there. I ended up in a hospital in Santa Monica, spent a long time in that hospital, came out of there with a back brace on and a, and a cane and I, I ran for six more years doing what we do, you know, mayhem, and came out of my last blackout of hundreds of blackouts, just came out of my last blackout, and uh, it was over, I don't know what happened in that blackout, I don't know what was different about that one from any other blackout, I knew I, knew I was going to die an alcoholic death, I had resigned myself to that, I wasn't suicidal, but death was an acceptable consequence to the way I was living. You know, I, you know, I, I was, I knew this is how I was going out. I couldn't stop it. I couldn't beat it. Right? Just take the ride. I came out of a blackout and it was over. And I don't know what happened. It was. I'm the lightning bolt through the window guy. You know, and just raised up. Both my hands were broken. The cops were outside. the The status of my life in that moment was, I was. It was November sixth. 1980. I was 215 pounds. I had hair down on my elbows. I was yellow. Thyroid shut down. The sack around my heart was swollen. I'd broken 74 bones. I had over 650 stitches in me. I'd been stabbed twice, shot at, malignant cancer. The violence had been insane in my life. Family's dead. I got no friends. I got no place to live. Uh, both my hands are busted. The police are outside deciding whether or not to charge me with the attempted murder of David Luboff. And there's a police car and an ambulance outside. And I just, there was a guy standing and then I just held up two busted hand, paws and I just went, help. And he just so happened to, he was one of those guys that knew that those were the magic words, help me, <laughs> right? And they threw me in the ambulance and off I went before the cops knew what was cooking, right? Ended up in UCLA emergency. They pumped my stomach, took me to Olivia Medical Center for a few days where I got worse. Then took me to Long Beach General Hospital. Uh, where I stayed for another 47 days. My detox was 52 days long <laughs> in an army cot. Two seizures, you know, it was a party. You know, there, there were no meds, you know, there were no detox meds. There was, there was nobody coming by saying, you know, are you a little anxious tonight or, you know, can I get you a little something to help you sleep? That guy never showed up the whole time I was there. He never came. And it was, it was just like, oh, you, Anybody who's kicked like that knows what, what I mean by it. you. You actually feel like you're dreaming while you're awake. It's a very weird state of mind, right? But I got there, and I remember Ray W. was my, my counselor. He was the guy who would come by the cot every once in a while and go, how you doing? Good? Great. And just walk by. And he said to me, uh, I was time to go, and he says, Earl, you got to go. And I went, okay, where? He goes, we don't care where. You just got to go. And he said, but we suggest wherever you go, you go to Alcoholics Anonymous, because if you don't, you're going to die. It's the only place a guy like you has got a chance. And I thought, well, that's kind of rude, but, you know, <laughs> okay, I guess, you know. No plan B, huh? <laughs> nothing, and no or, mm, not, nothing. Just go to AA or die. It's like, <laughs> great, okay. Probably better that it's that simple. So I ended up in the basement of a church on a Friday night. Mad dog and everybody, you know, just don't come up on me. I don't like you. I don't have to get to know you to know I don't like you. I already know. I don't like you. You know, and you're going to ask me questions I don't have the answers to, like, how you doing? I don't know. What's going on? I don't know. I don't have the answers to anything. 
And I don't like you because you're asking me these questions and making me look like the idiot that I am. You're exposing my ignorance of life. I don't know how to be in the world. I don't know how to be a part of a family. I don't know how to have friends. I don't know how to have a checking account. I've never paid taxes. I've been underground my whole life. I don't know how to do all this stuff. I see you all chit-chatting like you know each other. You're chit-chatting. Hate it. Hate the chit-chatting. Don't know what you're, what do you got to do? You seem to have so much to talk about. What are you talking about? It was just like, ugh, right? But every new, every meeting's got a newcomer who's got like nine months who's just got, who just got it. You know what I mean? He's been real hard for nine months and all of a sudden one day just goes, holy shit, I got it, right? And uh, everybody else was staying away from me, right? You know, the old timers were great. The old timers told me, they would go, how you doing over there, buddy? Get yourself a seat and a cup of coffee and good luck with all that you got going on right over there. And they'd left me alone, right? I'm like, yeah. But not this guy. His name was Vegas N. I'll never forget him. That was his name, Vegas N. And he saw me, and it was just new guy. And he came right at me with a big book in his hand. And he's like, <laughs> coming at me. And I'm just like, oh, what are you doing? And I'm just, uh, you know, everything just, uh-uh. This is not going to go well. Leave me alone. Nothing was going to deter him from helping out the new man. So he came up and he said, I'm in Vegas, I'm an alcoholic. And I said, yeah, me too. So what? Ain't exactly the highlight of my life. I don't know what you're so happy about. Get away from me. And he went, keep coming back. And like five, five guys standing over there went, I just see that. Vegas told the crazy guy to keep coming back. <laughs> so I just sat in the back with my arms folded, you know, and, and just stay away. I, you know, I'm here because I don't have any place else to be. And let's just not make an issue of it. Let's not point that out. All right. Just let me be here. And you did. You just let me be there. And a guy got up and he shared his experience, strength, and hope. And I didn't know that's what he was doing. He was just telling a story. Just so happens that he told a story that I understood. You know, he told a story. He, told, he talked about what, what his life had been like when he drank. And I was like, yeah, me too. And then he talked about that something had happened. I went, yeah. yeah. And then he talked about what his life was like today. And I was like, nope, I, I got nothing. <laughs> Absolutely none of that going on over here. But the first two, you had me with the first two. And I thought, that's pretty odd. And then I left. You know, they said, you know, they got up to do the prayer thing. And I, <laughs> and I mumbled through the, and then I left. And I thought that was pretty, I, the magic happened. Because I thought to myself, that was pretty cool. I got to come here with that guy had to say again. And I didn't know anything about this. I thought that's where that guy talked. On Friday, so I waited till the next Friday night, didn't drink, waited till the next Friday night and went there to hear that guy talk. So I sat there and listened to all the blah, 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 you know, the, you know, they rarely saw stuff. There's 12 things, A, B, C, and then, and then there's another guy and then they pass a basket and you don't take the money from the basket. And, you know, then there's a break and yeah, how you doing? Fine. I had my newcomer mantra down by then, second meeting, fine. It says, how you doing? Fine. What's going on? Fine. <laughs> Just leave me alone. <laughs> right? And I sat down. They said, they're speaking tonight. It's Betty. It's like, uh, time out. <laughs> Where the hell's Bob? Who's Betty? Right? And the guy sitting next to me goes, you're new, aren't you? And I said, yeah. What's your, what's your point? Where's Bob? He goes, well, no, we have a different speech. He starts breaking down. We have these kind of meetings and these kind of meetings. And, but, but, and I'm just like, stop it. You know, all the while, this like 75-year-old woman, in, you know, with the, the hair helmet, you know what I mean, and the little summer dress, you know what I mean? She's motoring up to the podium. And she gets up at the podium and says, hi, I'm Betty, I'm an alcoholic. I'm like, hi, Betty. Ugh, you know, how am I going to get my, this hour of my life back, right? <laughs> right, right? Right in the beginning, Betty says, you know, when I was a young woman, if you were reasonably attractive and had 50 cents, you could walk into a bar and drink for two weeks. And then broke down how you go about doing that. And by the time she was done, I looked at this same guy next to me and I went, you know, Betty's a badass. <laughs> I would so roll with Betty, man. <laughs> and I left freaking out. I mean, I'm identifying with a 75-year-old woman now. I don't even know what the hell's going on. And I'm, I was like, oh, we come back more. So then I was like, it was this the Trigrod group in Culver City, California. And there was a Tuesday night meeting, a Wednesday night candlelight meeting, a Thursday night meeting, a Friday night meeting. And then they all went over to uh, Ohio Street for a, a Saturday night. And then there was a Sunday morning meeting. And then all of a sudden, I'm, I'm in meetings every day. Just like I blinked. 
And these guys have just like eased, they've just slid up on me and I'm going to all these meetings. And all of a sudden, without me having like a vote or without anybody saying, Earl, we'd like to talk to you about the possibility of you becoming a little more involved in Alcoholics Anonymous. That never, there was never a clear conversation that occurred. It was just suddenly, I'm in meetings all the time. Everybody, I'm going, how did this happen? How did, how did I end up going to all these meetings? Everybody's just like, we have no idea. We don't know. We just said, come with us, and you did. <laughs> and, and, and I stayed, and I've never left. And my sobriety dates November 6, 1980. So this earlier this month, I celebrated 38 years sober. And I couldn't stay sober for a day. I couldn't do it. I've stayed sober because I've stayed an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous the whole way. I've always done four things. Always. I go to regular meetings regularly. I have a sponsor. I work the steps as outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. right? And I turn around and I'm of service to other people. That's it. That's the game. That's what I do. Now, there's a lot of variations and manifestations of that, and everybody's got their own style and their own way, which I think is great. I'm not one of these guys who's going to come in here and say, okay, we're going to go through the 12 steps, and finally you guys are going to go through the 12 steps the right way. Because <laughs> this guy does it. I've heard of the people you've had up here, and they're all doing it wrong. <laughs> I'm not that guy. Right? Because I think there should be a lot of different guys talking about the steps a lot of different ways so that there's a lot of different people who can hear a lot of, a lot of different ways and come in the way that, that they can identify with, which will probably change over time. That the guy that made sense to you when you were six weeks may not make sense to you when you're six months, but there will be a guy that does make sense at six months and at six years and at 16 years and right on up the, up the food chain, you know. And uh, that's been my experience. So, and. Just to warn you, I'm not a guy who's going to say, would you please turn to page 44 and the second paragraph, the word will. We will be discussing that until you all just slump over in your chairs. <laughs> I'm not that guy. I know guys like that, and you know what? They fill rooms. They fill rooms. That works for a lot of people. I apologize, I'm not that guy. Um, for me, this, this has been about this being an experience, that what the book for me was about was about a spiritual experience, that it was about bringing about a sense of this, a feeling, uh, something that I could identify with, something that, that felt noble, something that felt honorable, something that had a moral compass to it. I was talking to Jesse on the way in, and I said to him, uh, I, I, I said, we were just talking about all kinds of stuff, and I said, right in the middle of it, I just went, you know what? I'm 66 years old now, and I can do whatever the hell I want. I'm getting a compass tattooed on the back of my right hand. And he goes, that sounds fine. And he didn't seem to have a problem with it. I was, apparently the way I said it, I was ready for somebody to say, oh, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life, right? I'm getting a compass, just to come to the idea of that that's what Alcoholics Anonymous has been for me. It's been, it's shown me the way. It's shown me the way to be in the world. It's given me a path. It's just in every respect, it's made sense to me that it's felt authentic. It's felt real. It's felt human. You know, it's felt accommodating. It's all the things that I needed, it, it was willing to afford me. When I needed time, it gave me time. When I needed structure, it's given me structure. There's two things going on in the fellowship, in my opinion. There's the program, which is found in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and there's the fellowship, the community, which I think is, is, is equally as vital. Without the community, I, I, I can't see it. I can't see it. I, have to, I can't experience it. I need the repetition. I need the community. I need the fellowship. I need to belong because that's something that I, I, I shook my fist at on that mountain in Mexico and swore that I, 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 did, I was alone for good. I didn't want to belong to anything or anybody. Um, I did that when I was 12 when I turned my back on my family. But in fact, it's, of course, the thing that I've always wanted, right? I wanted to be, be a part of something, something that was bigger than me. And I found that here. This, isn't, this didn't give me back my life. It's given me the only life that I've ever had that's, that's been of any value beyond self right it's been since i've been here yet this there's a there's a friend of mine in a he's a great speaker great guy carl m 
I don't know if you guys know him. He's out of Covina, California. And he has this thing he says. He says, it's like every morning it's like we get together and we huddle up and we say, okay, remember, we're all bodily and mentally different from our fellows. Ready? Break. And then we go out into the day you know, and go do what we're going to do. And then we hook back up at the end of the day, quite possibly, for our second meeting to just see how that went, right? Or we do a 10-step or we call our sponsor or talk to our boys or do whatever we're going to do, right? But we stick together that this is not something I do alone. I just I talked this week to my original friend in Alcoholics Anonymous, Christopher. Christopher's uh, he'll be forty March fifth, um, and I mean he was carrying three knives when when we met, standing in the back of the meeting, actually in the parking lot of the meeting. That's where we were going when we started going to meetings at Ohio Street. We were in the parking lot. We could hear the speaker, right? But we just didn't want to actually give you the impression that you know we were all in. You know what I mean? <laughs> so we were in the parking lot. And there was this big black jazz pianist um, in the area. And a uh, um, great guy. God bless his soul, man. And he came running out of the dark screaming at us one day. The meeting's inside. We were like, Jesus. And we just ran. And we ran into the back. And we, now we were in the kitchen in the back of the hall. You know what I mean? It was like, all right. Can't, go, can't hang in the parking lot anymore. You're getting attacked by a large black man, right? So then we slowly were in the back of the meeting. Then we were in, in, in actually in the back of the meeting and not in the kitchen. And we moved our way up to the front of the meeting and we were in the fr- you know, sitting up front. And that's when it really started to click. And he and I, he's the guy that told me we need to do the steps out of the book. And we're going to go. And what we did was we, was we got the tapes of uh, the original Joe and Charlie, The Big Book Comes Alive. We got those tapes. They were on our day as cassette tapes. We got the cassette tapes and the book. And just started listening and writing and just went, went through it, man. Went through all 12 steps. And it started real simple for us. You know, we just read the step. Then we admitted we were powerless. And that our lives had become unmanageable. You know, as a direct result of one thing, our alcoholism. You know, that our lives were unmanageable because of alcoholism. And that we understood what alcoholism was. That alcoholism was an obsession of the mind and an allergy of the body. And any description of that that left either of those things out, left I left either of those out was an incomplete description of the illness, right? And that, uh, that the physical aspect of my disease, the lesser part, the part that I was focused on as a practicing alcoholic, was the physical phenomenon of craving. And, and, and I, it's, it's like a working word, and you know, I don't mean specifically craving like a doctor means it, it, but the craving meant I had an abnormal reaction to alcohol, that when you put alcohol in my body, I immediately craved more of the same. And I couldn't tell you when I, how much I was going to drink or when I was going to stop. And that that was true for me, always. I was, and I'm one of the lucky ones in that my alcoholism was severe from the gate. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like I drank and I got drunk immediately. I don't have any period of where I, I could look and go, well, it's going okay. You know, this is going all right. Nothing to be alarmed about. Everybody remain calm. You know, I didn't have that gradual slide into alcoholism. You know what I mean? Where I kept trying to, to, to grab a hold of days gone by or, you know, or, or regain control I once had. I never had to suffer through all that. You know, I, 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 you know, I feel terrible for, the, for those of you that did. I just, you know, fell off a cliff, you know, into blackout drinking alcoholism. It was, I was never in control. I never had the ability to manage it in any way, shape, or form. I drank until we ran out or, you know, somebody punched me in the face and knocked me out or I got handcuffed or I got committed. You know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm the alcoholic inertia, you know. An alcoholic in motion will stay in motion until acted on by an outside force. <laughs> that was me. It was just, I was going to roll until I dropped. And that was never my intention. You know, in the last few years when I would drink, it was just like, oh, well. I mean, I, I had no illusion that it might go okay, you know, but I had no idea which way it was going to go bad. I knew it was going to go bad. I just didn't know how. You know, I could wake up from a four-day blackout at home with no sign of having hurt anybody else or done any wreckage or insulted anybody. Or anything. That could happen. Or... You know, my answering machine is full of, you know, what's the matter with you messages? You know what I mean? <laughs> Those blackouts. Or when you come to in a different city, 
in a car with people you don't know. Or you come to in front of four police officers in Venice Beach on uh, Speedway, which is an alley, Speedway. In those days, Speedway in Venice at 3 p.m. in the afternoon was a dangerous place to be. I've come out of Black Hats at 3 (laughs) a.m. on Speedway with four cops looking at me, and they weren't happy. It was very unhappy police officers. And I'd learned, you just stand there with your hands where they can see them and just nod. (laughs) In the affirmative. They'll fill in the blanks for you. They're going to let you know why we're all here. Just keep your mouth shut and nod. Your only other option is to say, officers, I just got here. It's (laughs) It's this little blackout thing I do. I'm here, I'm not here, I'm here, I'm not here. Right? You're going to jail, right? Well, you're going to jail usually anyway, because, right, but... Anyway, I've only been arrested once sober. In 38 years, I've been arrested once. And it was for a warrant that I was in, a, and I, I was in a blackout for the entire thing. I had no memory of the incident whatsoever. The, the, what I did, getting arrested for it, any of it. I don't remember, I didn't remember any of it. And I got pulled over and I was two and a half years sober and I, was, I just thought, this is awesome. I'm pulled over. This is my car. I've just done the quick checklist. No weapons, no drugs, no contraband, no stolen property, nothing. Clean as a whistle. And in that glove compartment is insurance and registration. Driver's license in the back pocket. I can't wait to have this, have this exchange with this police officer. <laughs> this is going to be a whole, new, a whole new thing for me. I've never had this moment, right? So he comes over and says, Man, driver's license. Are you absolutely, officer, I'm going to get it, you know. Always, I still have a tendency to be a tenant too until they tell me they want something and then I tell them I'm going to reach into my back pocket now, <laughs> right? I move slow for cops still, just a tick of mine. And I give him the stuff and I give it to him and he says, will you please step out of the car? And I said, of course I will. Stepped out of the car, kablam, man, I am on the hood. I'm being click, click, and thrown in the back of the police car. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? And, and I had an outstanding warrant that I hadn't paid. Went, I had just gotten paid on a job I'd just done, a legal job that I had just done sober. I went into the bail, t- uh, to the, you go to the ticket window, the bail window. They told me what it was and I counted it out and I paid the last dollar of that bail with change. It, they literally, I had like 37 cents left over from, from making bail. Slid it across the counter. They gave me the appearance ticket and I walked out thinking, I got it. Clean it up. Clean it up. And I started to accelerate my, my step process and, and making amends became the primary thing in my life for the, for the first six and a half years of my sobriety. Um, the, f- the centerpiece of my life was a man's. I lived in a one-room apartment over a garage. We'll get to that then. Step one, the physical phenomenon of craving had to be acknowledged by us, that we had that. that there was no not having that once you have that. Once you have the physical phenomenon of craving, you have the physical no- phenomenon of craving. It's not going away. Right? Also, the greater aspect of the disease was the obsession of the mind. The obsession, the mind was, the th- learning about that changed the way I approached the steps, my life, addressing my alcoholism, that particular piece. Because I was the guy that if you looked at my drinking and stopping and starting and stopping and starting, spree remorse, spree remorse as they talk about it, I always loved to point at the, the, the place where I stopped. There's always on that circle, that loop that I'm in, there's an X that marks the spot. He stopped. The thing I didn't want to admit to myself that but that over on the other side of that circle, there was another X marks the spot, and it was, he starts again. That that was the critical point, right? That I always start again. I've stopped a thousand times, but I always start again, usually within the day. I don't make it through a whole day. I don't get a week or 10 days or stuff like that. If Unless you strap me to a gurney and a bootleg detox, I might get 72 hours, but that's it. The minute you let me up, oh, I'm drunk, right? So the obsession of the mind, the persistence of this illusion, is this, the belief in a lie that we can drink like a normal man is astonishing. Many of us pursue it to the gates of insanity and death. And that was me. You know, I'm a gate guy. 
uh, right? I get obsessed. What I am obsessed. The mental obsession to drink is there. So, so if I'm going to stay sober, the only way a guy like me is going to stay sober is if I can get comfortable sober. I got to get comfortable sober. The only way I'm going to get comfortable sober is if you can relieve me of the obsession to drink. Because if all you do is, if, if there's, a, there's a guy that's been sober a long, long time that has always said, if it was about the physical phenomenon of craving, detox centers would be kicking out winners. Man, it'd be 72 hours and free. What are you doing, Earl? I'm not drinking. Really? Yeah, how do you, how do, you do that? You don't drink. You, you sticking with that? Yeah, because I can do that. Right? I can not drink. I, that's what I say on the way to the bar. <laughs> the, the, it's a, the, it's, the obsession of the mind is so powerful. I have to be relieved of the obsession of the mind or I'm never going to get comfortable. And if I can't get comfortable, I'm not staying sober because the planets are going to line up and it's going to hit. She's going to say just the wrong thing at just the wrong time. Or, or I'm going to say just the wrong thing to just the wrong person at just the wrong time. Something's going to happen, and a drink's going to make sense again, suddenly for me. And I don't need, I, all I have to do is be a member of this fellowship. I don't have to look beyond this fellowship to know that that's true, because I've seen it happen countless times to people that are smarter, stronger, tougher than me, Right? So I got to find a way to get comfortable sober. And the only thing I have ever found that has, made, that has made it possible for me to be relieved of the obsession of the mind and be comfortable sober is to work the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's what they're for. It's mind, body, and spirit brought together as a whole human being. That's the balance that we seek. That's what the triangle and the circle are. The triangle is an ancient spiritual symbol. Mind, body, and spirit brought together as a whole human being. Therein lies the balance we seek, drunk or sober. Alcoholics Anonymous adopted the symbol, mind, body, and spirit, unity, service, and recovery. Unity's the body of bring it here because I can't stay sober, but we seem to be able to. First word in the steps is we. Step one, we admit it. We together admit it we, that we were alcoholic and that our lives were unmanageable as a result of this one thing. The recoveries of the mind got to work the steps to be relieved of the obsession. Isn't that amazing? The steps are designed to take relieve me of the most difficult component of my alcoholism. They go right to the heart of the matter. They, the steps are what allow me to become comfortable sober. And then having had a spiritual awakening as a result of doing that, I can practice the principles and carry the message. How can I help? I can be of service, right? But I got to do first things first. Step one, I got to accept that this is in fact the problem. This is my problem. Lack of power is my dilemma. And if that's my problem, what's my solution? Step two, could I come to believe, haven't done it yet, making the proposition to you here, could I come to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity, soundness of mind, relieve me of that obsession that makes it impossible for me to get comfortable sober? Could I come to believe that that, that, that is a possibility for a person like me? For me, it was someone said, well, I've tried everything I know how to do, and I keep getting drunk. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to allow for not believing in God. I'm going to have to allow that there is consciousness beyond that, which I currently possess that's out there. That's going to be able to turn this corner for me. It's going to make it possible for me. My sponsor later pointed out to me that you can't be mad at a God you don't believe in. That was a brutal moment, by the way. <laughs> wow. I still remember that. I literally stopped. We were walking, and I literally just stopped. And he was kept walking. He went, right, you coming? It's like, just, I'm going to need a minute. <laughs> well, that one, he loved those moments. He lived for those moments. The ones where he'd just go, excuse me, I'm going to just take this two by four and hit this guy here real quick. <laughs> <laughs> just, he loved it. Anyway, so step two, could I come to believe that this power, yes. Yes, it's going to have to be, because if it's not, I'm a dead man. So I, I, got, I got literally nothing to lose to go all in on two. I'm all in on two. Do you understand two full in completely? Probably not. But from where I'm standing, I'm all, I'm all in from here. With the hope that here changes <laughs> quickly. 
quickly. And fair enough, it's kept moving. Step three, right? Step three, be, turn my will and my life over to the care of a God I may or may not believe in, I may not understand. What could I be, what, was I willing to do that? Was I willing to turn my will and my life over? And, and my answer was, of course. For me, I'm a hopeless, low-bottom drunk. Of course, I'm willing to turn my will and my life over to something I, I don't, have, don't have the slightest understanding of. I don't understand God. I see evidence of God on a daily basis. I see evidence of a power greater than myself on a daily basis. I see evidence of consciousness beyond that which I currently possess every day. Walk outside tomorrow and go look at a tree. Beat that. Right? I'm standing here breathing in the oxygen, breathing out the carbon dioxide. Tree's just standing right there, breathing in the carbon dioxide, breathing out the oxygen. We got a little thing going on here. We got a little teamwork happening. We're working together, right? Things alive. I'll never forget, very high in biology class, <laughs> hearing about fibrovascular bundles and learning about, it's a whole botany thing, but I'm into the plant life. The plant life to me is evidence that there's a power greater than me, right? All I got to do is be driving and I just go, oh, I'm not, it ain't me. Look at that. So there's evidence anywhere you, if you're willing, if you're willing, there's evidence everywhere you go of a power greater than yourself. Just to remind you that step three is doable, is pertinent, is meaningful to somebody like me. Right? And it tells me I got to get down on my knees and turn my will and my life over to the care of this God that I, I, I may or may not understand. Sure. Like I got a good debate to get into right now. Just, just take a quick look over this shoulder. Nope. Let's hit our knees, shall we? It's all wreckage. It's all bad news. It's all things that I thought were great ideas at the time that turned out to go horribly wrong. There are hurt feelings, broken hearts, right? People shaking their heads. People who loved me, trusted me, had faith in me, ho hoped the best for me. All of them let down, dashed on, hope dashed on. I mean, alcoholism. You're a good guy, Earl, but we can't hang. We love you, Earl, but we got to let you go. One right after another, till I was just alone, sitting in the back of a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And then it came back. So will I hit my knees and turn my will and my life over to the care of a God? I don't understand. You bet. Do you believe in him? Great. We'll just do it together. You believe, I'll wonder, and we'll both mean it. <laughs> and we did. Got back up on her, got back up and immediately began upon a course of rigorous action, which I guess we get into tomorrow. But that one, two, three, man, that, those are some big dogs right there. You know, I can't, God can, I'll let them, I believe is the commonplace paraphrasing of the, the first three steps, right? Right? It's really, and, and, and to me, it's about not making it so damn complicated. Don't make it so complicated. My life depended on get sober or die. Very simple. Get sober or die. Or for some of you, I would suggest even worse, get sober or continue to suffer beyond any suffering you thought was humanly possible. You don't get to die. You have to wake up again and again and again. How many people in this room have woke up in the morning and, and said, really? <laughs> <laughs> Right? Just like, how is that possible? How am I still here? Uh, yeah. I remember being, I was at an, a meeting, and I walked, there was this very pretty brunette sitting there. She looks familiar. And I walked over, and I sat down next to her. She was talking to this guy, and I sat down next to her. I just thought I was being polite. I just waited, you know. I wasn't working at an angle. I just, she looked familiar. So she turned around, and she goes, hi. And I said, hey, you look familiar. And she gave me that look that pretty girls give you like weak buddy so, so, so. 
That's a, that's a, that's a very weak line. <laughs> right? And she said, what's your name? And I said, Earl Hightower. And she screamed. I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> what did I do? And she said, I, she said, oh my God, and she took my hand. Like she, I mean, she like reached out and took my hand. She went, I thought you were dead. And I went, well, kind of, yeah. You know, and, but I've been here for like four years. And she had gotten, she'd been sober like four and a half months or something like that. But she had been to a couple of parties and she said from the podium that I was the guy, she went to a party one night and there was a guy there using, it was the first time in her life she th was looking at somebody and thought, that guy's gonna die right in front of me. The way that guy's carrying on, he's going to die right, right now, right in front of me. And it was me. Because I had to blot out the intolerable nature of my existence. I'm a guy that actually, I belong, I belong to you. I, you know, there was, I was going to end up here in the grave. There was no place, there's no place else for me to go. There was no therapy that was going to fix this. You know what I mean? There was no field trip that was going to kick it in the right direction. You know what I mean? This was it. Alcoholics Anonymous or bust. That was me. So Ray W. was right when he said to me, go to AA or die, right? He wasn't being dramatic. dramatic. He was being clear. <laughs> go to A&A. &A. So I came to the A&A &A and I've never left you. And those three steps, guide, guided by Joe and Charlie, the original Joe and Charlie, and the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, the, the men and women who wrote this, Dr. Paul, right? The doctor's opinion, and the first 164 pages made it possible for me to have a life beyond my wildest dreams, which, which I have had. I'm an old man now, but I'm killing it still, man. I'm having a ball, right? And I'm not doing it at the expense of other people. I'm not hurting people. I'm not... People can leave me in their homes and not be at risk. That's meaningful to me because I remember the first time I was in a guy's apartment and he went... I'm out of smokes. I'm going to run and get a pack. I'll be right back. And he just walked out the door and left me in his apartment by myself. And I just went, why does this feel so weird? <laughs> and it hit me that it, it, it never occurred to him that I'd rob him right now, right? Which prior to AA would have been the minute I heard his engine turn over, I'd have been on my feet, <laughs> right? Looking for what I could get out of this joint. Right? I mean, you just couldn't leave me alone anywhere. I'd, I'd steal your stuff, right? But I just sat there patiently. No, I didn't. I did sit there patiently. You know, I realized it was the first time I'd been in somebody's house sober and I was being trusted not to steal. And it made me very anxious until he got back. When he got back, I was like, oh, good. He's like, what's wrong? I went, nothing. Everything's where you left it. <laughs> you know, got the little sideways look, you know, and we moved on. Well, you guys know what I see. This is the only place in the world I can talk about the things I've been talking about tonight. And everybody just goes, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, nobody gets real worked up about any of it. You know? Because it's us. We're the same. We're, it, it all comes down to that same broken spirit, you know? That, and, and, and being given a shot at life again that's meaningful. But having a foundation upon which we can walk the earth free men no longer enslaved by alcohol or drugs. We got set free by Alcoholics Anonymous. We have this foundation. What we're going to talk about this weekend is that foundation, the foundation of the 12 steps. And how, what time is it? For the love of God. 8.29. 8.29. Gone far over, no, I've got a minute to go, don't I? Start at 7.30? Did I start at 7.30? Fine. Yeah, but when you said it, you said it, right? I believe I've covered the basis. Right? So thank any questions? Anybody got any questions they want to throw at me? Yes, sir. Did you ever make an amends to Tiny? I tried, but I couldn't find him. You know, he actually became friends. He felt really bad about it. Because, you know, when I gotta just tell everybody, Tiny's the guy, the big guy in high school that I got in a fight with him the first week where I got my rep as being a maniac, right? It's because I'd lived in a violent home and I knew about big guys thumping on little guys. I know how to fight, right? So he slapped me in the back of the head and sent me and my books flying on the quad in front of a bunch of other students. And he thought he just smacked a little kid, you know? What big deal, you know? That kid, hey, 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 oh, watch your back there, buddy. You know, he's gonna walk away. And I just got up 
He didn't realize he had hit somebody that was willing to die over this. <laughs> so I just walked up to him and I walked over and I hit him as hard as I could, which had no effect on Tiny whatsoever. You know what I mean? He just kind of went pop and just looked at me like, really? And I just stood right in front of him, my hands up like, let's do this. He's like, okay. Bam! Flat on my back. <laughs> right? One punch. He never hit me at any, one, at any point in this process. I was only hit once each time. It, it never took Tiny two punches to knock me down. It only took one. And he knocked me down, and I popped right back up. Right? Whap! Down I went. Give me a minute. Right? Finally got back. All right. Let's go. You know, now t and now Tiny's looking at me like, why are you doing this? Right? Tiny's starting to feel bad about it now because I'm not letting him just pick on me. And everybody else is just like, dude, we don't even know you, but stay down. Just stay down. This is getting really uncomfortable for everybody. Right? <laughs> I just, pow, down again. He hit me, I don't know, five, six times before finally I couldn't get up. You know, I was down. And Tiny walked away and felt terrible about it. And I went back to my room, you know, all oh my God eyes shut, you know, I'm bleeding, I mean, I'm a mess, you know, but I felt like, hey, I, st I stood up, right, that's how I'm, I was wired, like an idiot, right, <laughs> and that's when the cool guys said, hey, there's this maniac high terror kid, you got to check him out, man, he attacked Tiny, it, you know, it had turned into, I'd gone after Tiny, right, <laughs> so Tiny, when I found, when he saw me, saw me at the, de at the dining room, I don't really talk about this much, but when I was in the dining room, I walked in the dining room and I saw Tiny, and I just gave him one of these. <laughs> like, I ain't scared of you, right? Eh. Well, I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I did not look good. <laughs> and he just looked at me like, dude, what is the matter with that guy, right? And I just sat there, you know, and I'm trying to, you know, we're in the dining hall and there's a mess, and people are going, are you all right, young man? I'm fine. I'm absolutely fine. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm all right, and I'm eating, and the soup's falling out of my mouth. You know, what I mean? it's just like, what? You know what I mean? We, but when we left that dining room, he came up to me after. He goes, "Hey, man," and I went up to him, and he was probably 17, right? I was 12. He came over to me, and he, and he stuck out his hand, and he said, I, I, "They call me Tiny," and I said, "I'm Earl." All right, man. I said. All right. Really thinking to myself, please don't hit me again, man. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's really starting to hurt now. You know? and, and we were cool. We were good. You know, that was like, he said, to, as far as I'm concerned, he apologized. I accepted his apology. I apologized for being a knucklehead who wouldn't just lay down, you know, embarrassed him like, you know, I made it worse. Clearly, I, my side of the street was not clean on this little duet, you know what I mean? And we kind of did our thing, and we were fine the rest of the time. He ended up getting expelled. Yeah, well, most of us did get expelled. I just got up and left at one point after four and a half years. I thought, that's enough Latin. See ya. So that's tiny. Anybody else? Which one? Oh, she, um, no, I'm, I am currently with my final wife, my, I'm, I've been married four times, too drunk, too sober, but I've been, I, I was drunk a while and I've been sober quite a while, so, you know, spread them out, there's no, you know, um, but she actually is, to my knowledge, still sober, adopted a girl from Russia and lives somewhere on the East Coast. Yeah. If you think of more, we'll talk over the weekend. Thanks a lot, you guys. Have a great night. <laughs>